Hello, 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 and welcome to the marvelous Monday broadcast of Miss Hope's Reading Hour. Happy President's Day, everybody who got to be off today to celebrate the President of the United States. Hopefully you enjoyed your day. Hopefully you may have learned something about presidents today. I learned something new that I did not know. Um, I was actually watching a game show today and I learned this. No, it wasn't a game show. It was a morning news show as a matter of fact, but they were playing a game with a guest who had come on and come to find out that there are more presidents that had the first name James than any other president. I did not know that. So you learn something new every day, right? Well, hopefully you enjoyed your president's day. I know my young ones did because they did not have to go to school today, but hopefully you learned something new, at least one thing. See, that was my one thing. I try to learn something new every day. I think it's very important to learn something new every single day. So I try to keep put my ears on, open my ears, open my mind so I can learn something new every single day. And sometimes it comes in the most unexpected places. I did not expect to learn that while I was watching the news this morning. And they were playing that game and I said, oh, well, how about that? Most pre the, the most presidents that have had the same name, James. So you learn something new. Anywho, how was your weekend, my friends? I know it was really icy outside in many parts of the United States. Depending on where you live, could have been really cold like it is here in Philadelphia. Icy like it is here in Philadelphia and in Pennsylvania, cold. Some people got snow, some people got ice, some people got slushy, rain, all types of stuff. Hopefully you all have been safe and you got to maybe go out and get some fresh air. Sometimes I like going to the door, going out, getting a burst of cool air. And I'm like, ooh, that feels good until it feels cold and I'm like, I gotta go back in the house. Well, hopefully you had a great weekend and that you are ready for tomorrow. Ready to learn some new things. Ready to um, go back to work. Mm, I have to go back to work, but hey, you learn new things at work too, right? So my young ones going back to school, my parent friends, teacher friends, parent teacher friends, and all of my older young ones. If you haven't caught on to that yet, Miss Hope calls the adult people the older young ones, okay? So the young ones have to go to work and the older young, I mean, the young ones go to school, the older young ones go to work, but hopefully you have had a chance to just relax and chill out, watch some TV, play some games, have some fun with your family and your friends. And of course, join me here on Miss Hope's Reading Hour for some really great books. So today our books are, as you can hear our ambiance music in the background, it's about politics, of course, because it's President's Day, hello. So we are going to talk about the early stories of some African-American politicians from here in our beautiful United States. So none of them are presidents, but they're people that you know. We're just gonna put it that way. If you saw the teaser, you already know who they are, okay? Now, let us get these things out of the way. The wonderful music that you hear on Miss Hope's Reading Hour and the great books that we read. Unfortunately, Miss Hope and Miss Hope's Reading Hour do not own the rights to any of it. But 
it is here for your listening and reading enjoyment. Okay. Just got to put that out there. And of course, the two books, the first books that we are going to read today, they are from my latest shipment of books. Okay. New books, brand spanking new. Okay. And we will have another shipment of books coming very, very soon because I finally hit order on the shopping cart. I did. It took Miss Hope a little time, but she did it. Okay. Now, though new books are coming in all the time, we're reading through all those new books, just reading, 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 reading. Okay. So if you look down at the ticker, these are the ways that you all can donate to the Miss Hope's Reading Hour Library. That is how we get all of our books. We get them by donation. Either you are donating, I am donating, we are donating together. That is how we get our new books. So please do donate via Cash App. All of you who have donated before, thank you so much. Feel free to donate again if you like. No donation is pushed away. No matter how small or how big, every donation is appreciated. So my friends, let us look at the two new books we have for today. So our first book is called Preaching to the Chickens. The story of young John Lewis. Now, I know a lot of you heard about Mr. John Lewis from various stories, like the story of Selma, um, his saying that he always said, good trouble, make sure that you get in the good trouble, meaning getting in the good trouble, making sure that everyone has what they need, that you're fighting for the rights of everyone, that's good trouble. This is his story when he was a young one. So, Preaching to the Chickens, the story of young John Lewis by Jabari Asim, illustrated by E.B. Lewis, Preaching to the Chickens. And I think you'll recognize this author from Superheroes Are Everywhere by our now Vice President, Kamala Harris, illustrated by Michelle Renee Rowe. Superheroes Are Everywhere. I can't wait to read this book. I read some of it and I was like, oh, I do like this book. So we will get into that one and of course, you know, we we getting down to the wire. Let's see how much we have left now of who stole New Year's Eve. You see that? You see that? That's it, friends. That right there. This thinness right here. That's it. That's all we got left. So hopefully by Fabulous Raye, we will find out. Who stole New Year's Eve? Who stole Ice Eve and the other ice sculptures? Why? And what was going on with all those other clues and other things that were going on? Okay. We got to find it out. Because um, Miss Martha Freeman, you're wearing me out. It's just so many clues and so many questions. Okay. Now, let us get to our first book. So I think we'll keep listening to the patriotic music. All right, so this has a dust jacket and guess what? It looks the same underneath the dust jacket. Ha ha ha. Preaching to the Chickens, the story of young John Lewis by Jabari Asim. This is a Nancy Paulson's book book. Okay. 
So it's a new book. New, new, brand spanking new. Little John Lewis loved spring. He loved it not only because it was time, because it was the time when the whole planet came alive, but also because it was the season of the chicks. Winter was too cold to bring them safely into the world and summer was too hot. Spring was just right. Everyone on the farm had work to do. Work and put your trust in God, John's mama liked to say, and God's going to take care of his children. Trusting in God was easy. Work was a harder bargain. There was just so much to do on a huge farm in Southern Alabama. Every March, John's father hitched the plow to his stubborn old mule. Giddy up, he'd shout. And together, they'd break new ground, carving lines in the earth. In the fall, after months of planting, weeding and tending, the cotton would be ready for picking. John's mother cooked the family meals from vegetables she grew. Collards, tomatoes, sweet potatoes, and other goodies. She cleaned the family's clothes in a big iron pot stirring them in the boiling water and washing them with homemade soap before hanging them on the line to dry. Yes, Lord, plenty of work on a farm. Whew. That had to be hard work, stirring all those clothes. John was excited to be put in charge of the chickens. There were about 60 of them, Rhode Island Reds, strong-winged bantams, Dominiques with gray stripes as dull as dishwater and legs as yellow as daisies. John loved to see them flutter and strut and flap their wings. Every day, John got up early and fed them dried corn just shelled from the cob, then lined their nests with fresh straw. <laughs> the chickens said. John knew they meant, thank you. <laughs> They're like, come on, bring on the corn. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Bring on the corn. In a soft voice, John would say to them, enjoy this day that God has given. The chickens looking straight at him seemed to understand. <laughs> as much as John loved spring, he loved church even more. On Sundays, the whole family headed to services. John and his brothers were dressed in slacks and crisp white shirts, his sisters in neat dresses. Outside the church, friends and relatives greeted each other with big smiles. Inside, voices joined in song. John often listened to gospel and country music on the radio. He enjoyed it, but he found his favorite music of all in church. Plain voices praising God without any instruments at all. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound 
that saved the wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. As the worshipers clapped and sang, John felt the Holy Spirit rock in the room. It reminded him of the peace he felt when he roused the chickens from slumber and led them into the light of a brand new day. Like the ministers he heard in church, John wanted to preach, so he gathered the, his chickens in the yard. John stretched his arms above his flock and let the words pour forth. The chickens nodded and dipped their beaks as if they agreed. They swayed to the rhythm of his voice. John's brothers and sisters couldn't tell one bird from another. John knew every one and he had a line of verse for each of them. Blessed are the peacemakers, he'd say when they fought over their morning meal. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, he would tell a hen who didn't want to share, for they shall be satisfied. One day, the rolling store, the rolling store man stopped by to make a trade. His truck was packed with flour, sugar, cooking oil, and bolts of cloth in bright colors. I've got plenty of good things, he said to John's mom and dad. I'll give them to you for a healthy hen. But John did not want to part with any of his chickens, and he knew they wanted to stay with him. He convinced his parents there were other things to trade, like eggs and seeds. The chickens stayed on the farm, and John learned to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. When the hen called Big Bell, fell into the well and got stuck. John was determined to save her. He filled a basket with breadcrumbs and when he lowered it down, she climbed in and was pulled to safety. God makes miracles every day, John preached. When you're down, he lifts you up. Sister Big Bell, I believe you know what I mean. <laughs> Big Bell replied. John knew she meant, amen. <laughs> John even baptized the chicks, bathing them in water from an old syrup can. But Lil Pullet had stayed under too long and to appear to have drowned. John prayed over her and laid her in the sun after a while, she began to breathe again and soon was up on her feet. He can heal the sick, John declared, and raise the dead. Little Pullet, can I get a witness? Peep, 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 said Little Pullet. John knew she meant amen. John loved to tell the hens and chicks the good news. While he fed and watered them, he spoke about the value of hard work and patience. With faith and hope, he said, a bountiful harvest was sure to come. John's Hen House Sermons 
became so regular that his brothers and sisters took to calling him preacher. He didn't mind. He knew that someday he'd speak before thousands. He hoped that his words would stir people's souls and move them to action. For now though, he had his own church right, right here among the pine trees and rolling hills of Southern Alabama. Morning would find him in his usual place, preaching to the chickens. Author's note. Oh, that was the end. <laughs> Let's read the author's note. I've always been an enthusiastic admirer of John Lewis. I knew of his brave participation as an original member of the Freedom Riders, Freedom Riders, Americans who in 1961 rode buses into the deep South to protest segregation of black and white travelers who were forced to sit on separate benches and drink from separate fountains. I was aware that he had been chairman of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC pronounced SNCC, a group of young people who use civil disobedience to work toward full equality for all. I knew that he had been the youngest member of the big six, black leaders who led the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963 the largest public demonstration in American history at that time. I knew that in 1965, he stood with Reverend Hosea Williams at the front of the line when troopers attacked unarmed demonstrators on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama. I learned even more about Lewis when I read Walking with the Wind, his extraordinary memoir. In it, he wrote, I never really saw myself as a leader in the traditional sense of the word. I saw myself as a participator, an activist, a doer. Not long after I read the book, I met Lewis when I had the great privilege of introducing him at the National Book Festival on the National Mall. I found myself drawn to the passages in his memoir in which he described his childhood in Pike County, Alabama. As a young boy, he dreamed of being a preacher, moving crowds to action with the power of his sermons. But he was a doer even then. And instead of just dreaming, he practiced with a captive audience, the chickens on his family farm. I preached to my birds just about every night, he wrote. They would sit very quietly, some slightly moving their heads back and forth, mesmerized, I guess, by the sound of my voice. I could imagine that they were my congregation and me, I was a preacher. I relied on Lewis's recollections when fashioning this story, especially his memories of Lil Pullet and Big Bell. I hope readers will find the resulting tale as mesmerizing as those chickens found young John Lewis long ago. What a great story. Preaching to the chickens, the story of young John Lewis. How it started with him even as a little guy, wanting to speak up for people who did or chickens who didn't have a voice and wanting his voice to make a difference, which it did. It made a difference for Big Bell when, you know, she wanted, they wanted to sell her or trade her for some other things. And it worked in all of the activism that he did while um, fighting for equality for African-Americans and for everyone. Such a great story. So glad that I got to read it with all of you. Now, superheroes are everywhere. 
by Kamala Harris, vice president now, Kamala Harris. Kamala, sorry, got to pronounce that right. Got to remember that. Kamala Harris. And the dust jacket off, <laughs> it looks the same. Superheroes are everywhere. Oh, and if you get this book, there's pictures of her as a little one and her family. She was a cute little baby. Superheroes are everywhere. And this is a Philomel Books book by Vice President Kamala Harris. Faster than a rocket ship, stronger than a tidal wave, braver than a lion. Superheroes always make the world better no matter what's going on. Whenever there's trouble, superheroes should show up just in time. When I was a kid, I was sure that superheroes were everywhere, blending in with regular people, ready to do good at a moment's notice. I was determined to find them. So I started my superhero search right at home. Oh, let's, let's change that. There we go. I always got to make sure with new books, sometimes the pages stick, it to, stick, it, stick it together. Ah. Heroes make you feel special. It didn't take long to find one. I noticed my mom had a magic touch. Her hugs made me feel warm, safe, and even strong. She knew I loved good food, so she taught me her secret recipes. My mom did that too. <laughs> and we'd create huge, delicious meals together for our friends and family. I even cooked some of the dishes all by myself. See, Kamala, mom, my mom would say, you can do anything if you put your heart in it and try hard. Anything in the world. My mom was a superhero because she made me feel special. She believed in me. And that helped me believe I could do anything. Who makes you feel special? Heroes are people you can count on. My sister Maya and I did everything together. Ballet class, piano lessons, bike riding, and board games. I knew that if I ever needed her, she'd be there. One half of our dynamic duo. When we felt sad, mom would throw us an unbirthday party so we'd feel better. Together, we'd eat unbirthday cake, open unbirthday presents, and dance around the living room. Maya was always by my side. My sister was a superhero because she was someone I could count on. Who can you count on? Heroes make you feel brave. I kept searching for superheroes in other parts of my family. My dad wanted me to be fearless. Whenever we were at the park, He'd let go of my hand and call out, run, Kamala, run. And I'd run as far as I could for as long as I could. My dad was a superhero because he made me feel brave. Who makes you feel brave? <laughs> Heroes stand up for what is right. My grandmother was one of the smartest people I've ever met. And she uses her smart, used her smarts and her voice to speak out for women who were being hurt and to teach them how to stay healthy. My grandfather used his voice to make India a free country. All of my grandparents in India 
and in Jamaica were superheroes for standing up for what's right. Who stands up for what's right in your life? Superheroes are best friends. My best friend and I cared about each other. My best friends and I cared about each other. When I was in kindergarten, I told a boy to stop teasing one of my best friends. And another time, my best friend helped me when I fell on the playground. We all wanted to feel safe at school. My best friends were heroes because they made one another feel safe. Who are your best friends? Heroes are teachers. Heroes are teachers! I had to say that loud. I loved my first grade teacher, Mrs. Wilson. She taught us about plants and flowers, sang songs with us from cultures around the world, and revealed how tadpoles turned into frogs. Teachers like Mrs. Wilson are superheroes because they show us the whole wide world and help us chase our dreams. Who is your favorite teacher? Heroes are kind. When I looked, I found a superhero right down the street. Mrs. Shelton was our family friend and was like a second mom to me. She watched Maya and me while our mom was at work. We'd gobble up her homemade biscuits, peach cobbler, and gumbo for special occasions and pile into her car on Sundays for church. Mrs. Shelton treated everyone with love and respect. Her kindness made her a superhero to me. Who is kind to you? Heroes explore with you. Aunt Lenore and I chased fireflies and caught them in jars. Uncle Sherman taught me to play chess. Aunt Mary and I read book after book together. And Uncle Freddie took me to museums where we'd see dazzling artwork. My aunts and uncles, my mom's friends who were part of our family, helped me explore my world. And that made them superheroes. Who helps you to explore? Heroes work hard. Even as I got older, I kept searching for superheroes. When it was time for me to go to college, I was excited to go where my Aunt Chris went to study at Howard University. My grandmother hadn't had the chance to go to college, but she encouraged her kids, my mom and my aunts and uncle to study hard and they did. My mom became a scientist. My uncle Balu is an economist. My aunt Sarala is a doctor. And my aunt Chinny works with computers. They were superheroes because they showed me that by working hard, I could be whatever I wanted to be when I grew up. Who do you know who works hard? Heroes protect people. After college, I wanted to become a lawyer like some of the people I looked up to, Thurgood Marshall, Constance Baker Motley, and Charles Hamilton Houston. They fought in court because they knew that people aren't always treated equally 
but should be. Like them, I wanted to make sure that the law would protect everyone. These lawyers were superheroes because they protected people by using the power of words and ideas. Who protects you? Heroes make a difference together. Once I became a lawyer and then a senator, I worked with all sorts of people to help kids. Even better, I got to know amazing kids who want to make the world a better place. And uh, you know what else I learned? Hmm. I wonder what that is. Heroes are you. Superheroes are everywhere you look, even inside of you. Are you kind, brave, and curious? Are you a best friend? Do you share? Do you treat people fairly? Do you lend a hand when others need help? You're a hero by being the very best you. Now that's pretty super. <laughs> the end. That's supposed to be like a mirror at the end so you can see you. Because you have the potential of being a hero. Oh, and look here, there's a hero code. Let's see what that hero code says. It says, do you wanna be a superhero? It's easier than you think. The first thing to do is raise your right hand and say the words on the next page out loud. If you want to wear a cape while you do this, you can, but you don't have to, but it could be kind of fun. Anywho, I promise to, if you would like to repeat after me, I promise to make people feel special. Be someone people can count on. Help people be brave. Stand up for what's right. Be a best friend. Be a good teacher. Be kind. Explore with my friends and family. Study and work hard. Protect people who need it. Make a difference when I can. I promise to be the very best me I can be. That, my friends, is the hero code. If you did that, if you repeat it after me, Kamala's Hero Code, you are well on your way to being a superhero if you plan on doing some of those things. You may not be perfect at all of them all the time, but if it's in your heart to be that kind of person, guess what? You can be one of those superheroes that are everywhere. Such a good book. Every page where they said superheroes are this and superheroes are that. I could think of people in my life that I have met. Think of my friends. Think of my mom and my dad and other people, teachers who have been heroes to me. So this would be a very good book, my teacher friends. You want to get a writing assignment in. Superheroes are everywhere. You could get a writing assignment in. Drawing pictures. Listen, good book, friends. Make sure you get that one. Superheroes are everywhere. Such a good book. All right, my friends, my friends. You know where we are. You know where we are. We are 
at who stole New Year's Eve? We got to find out, okay? So we are in chapter 24. Now, before this chapter, in chapter 23, chapter 22 and 23, we found out Luau is sick for some reason. We have no idea what has made Luau sick. And we still don't know why Yasmin was coming, scooping Luau up and hanging out with Luau, the cat, Alex's cat, without Alex knowing. Because you know, she hasn't really been hanging out with Alex much because she's upset about him hanging out with Eve, the new girl on the block, because she thinks that Alex is just not interested in being friends anymore with her because he's now friends with Eve. She's still upset with Eve about laughing about her, unfortunately, really bad singing. Okay. So, Alex is trying to put a costume on Luau for the pet costume parade that's happening instead of the ice carnival because all of the ice sculptures have been stolen, not just Ice Eve. But he realizes that he's sick, so his dad takes him to the vet. He still goes to the pet carnival. They're on their way to the pet carnival, pet costume carnival. There is a traffic jam and they have no idea why there's a backup going to the pet costume parade. This is where we are right now in chapter 24 of Who Stole New Year's Eve. I have been a kid for more than 11 years and one thing I've learned is it's mostly a waste of time to argue with grownups. Now though, I had no choice. I had to, I had the most detecting experience of anybody in the car. I needed Sophie's and Eve's help to solve the case. And I didn't want the two of them to get discouraged. Well, actually, Mrs. Henry, I said politely, when you're working on a case, there is always a moment like this, a moment when nothing adds up and it seems hopeless and you want to quit. But then you do a little more work and all of a sudden, when you least expect it, things start to make sense. Inching the car forward, Mrs. Henry glanced at me in the rear view mirror and flashed a smile. So if you weren't going to the parade, she said, what would you be doing next to solve the mystery? I thought about that. Probably writing out a list of suspects. The car came to a complete stop again. Sophie slumped back and frowned. Eve said, so let's talk about suspects. Do you have suspects, Miss Fr Mrs. Henry asked. There are always suspects, Sophie said, cheering up a little. I think Mrs. Miggins did it, did it. Again with Mrs. Miggins, the toy store owner. Sophie, you know that's not how it works, I said. You don't just pick somebody you don't like and announce that's who did it. You have to be objective and use reason. And you have to think about means, motive, and opportunity, Eve said. Oh, hogwash, Sophie said. Sometimes you just make good, make a good guess. Okay, fine, Sophie, I said. Why, Mrs. Miggins? Motive. She doesn't like the ice carnival, Sophie said. Means. She has a truck. She needs one for her store. Opportunity. She lives by herself except for Leo G. So for all anybody knows, she was running around, running around all over town last night stealing ice sculptures. But why did she steal Ice Eve, I asked. Sophie shrugged. Because she wanted to complete the set. Mm -hmm. Eve and Mrs. Henry laughed. Sophie frowned. I wasn't trying to be funny. 
Mrs. Henry made the right onto Main Street, but the traffic didn't let up. Eve said, do I get to pick now? Because I say Mr. Glassy. His motive is to get the insurance money for the ice carnival. His means is the trucks they use to haul the sculptures in the first place. An opportunity? Well, nobody would think a thing about him being downtown during the night. Even if he got caught, he could just tell people he was moving the ice sculptures around. Sophie nodded, pretty good for a rookie. Plus, I don't like those little glasses of his or the way he bounces around all the time. Case closed, he did it, except, well, I do have another suspect, Coach Banner. What, I said, who, Eve said. Would that be Sam Banner, Mrs. Henry asked. Tom and I met him and his wife at an event a few weeks ago when he came out to when we came out to visit. They were planning to invest in Tom's technology in gasoline. And they did, Sophie asked. Invest, I mean. Mrs. Henry winked at us in the rearview mirror, which seemed to mean yes. But then she said, I'm not supposed to talk about it. Sophie was nodding. Oh yeah. Sam Banner used to be in the army, so he's good at organizing junk. He used, he used to own a lawn care company, so I'll bet he probably still got trucks and equipment. But what about motive, I asked. Money, said Sophie simply. What money, I asked. I'm still working on that part, Sophie said. But which sculpture disappeared first? Ice Eve and Ice Eve's dad is an investor of grass, inventor of gasoline, and gasoline is going to make money. We hope, Miss Henry interrupted. Sophie nodded. Exactly. So there you have it, all neatly tied up and connected. Um, somehow. But don't you have it backward, I asked. Sam Banner wants gasoline to succeed. That makes him in favor of Professor Henry. More likely, Eve said, somebody who didn't like my dad or my family would steal Ice Eve, like Yasmin's family. Hey, and besides that, they're friends with that crazy Professor Olivo guy. And we, and we know he doesn't like my dad or his research. Yasmin and her family would never steal anything, I said. What happened to being objective, Sophie asked. Give me a break, Sophie, I said. You know Yasmin almost as long as I have. Anyway, this whole thing can't be about Eve's family because that wouldn't explain the sculptures downtown. Sophie closed her eyes. This must be the part where I always get a headache. Hey, you guys, what about this? Eve asked. Maybe we've been looking at the whole thing the wrong way. Maybe instead of trying to figure out who took the ice sculptures, we should be trying to find the ice sculptures. Whoever took the sculptures had to put them someplace, right? Someplace big if they're all together and someplace inside to hide them. Sophie sat up as if now she was paying attention. Also, wouldn't it have to be someplace cold? Otherwise the sculptures would get all melty. I know a place like that, Miss H Mrs. Henry said. And I know something else too. It'll be faster for all of us to walk to the college gates from here. So I'm gonna make a right turn and park in the lot, okay? We all agreed. It was only a few blocks to the college gates, and we didn't have anything much to carry. What place do you know that's like that, Mom? Eve asked as the SUV came to a stop. RSFZ. Mrs. Henry pulled the key out of the ignition. You know, your dad's storage facility out beyond the stadium. The R stands for refrigerated. The college built it for him 
because some of the chemicals he uses to make gasoline are volatile at warm temperatures. Volatile. There's that word again. I couldn't remember exactly what it meant, but Sophie's uncle Al had said something about delivering hazmats, hazardous materials, out to Professor Henry's facility too. Were those the same chemicals Mrs. Henry was talking about? Chapter 25. You know the rare College Springs traffic, traffic jam that forced us to park five blocks from the start of the parade? It wasn't caused by an accident at all. It was caused by the crowds of people coming to the first annual Ice Carnival costume pet parade. We figured it out when we finally got to the college gates and saw how many people were already there. Sophie high-fived Eve. We must have done a really great job on publicity. Besides a ton of parents and kids and pets wearing crowns and coats and sweaters and cowboy hats, we saw Tim Roberts taking pictures and Mr. Glassy, who gave us a thumbs up. We also ran into Mrs. Miggins and Leo G., who was wearing a black bow tie around his neck. Amazingly, Mrs. Miggins was smiling. In one afternoon, our store sold out of doll clothes and kids costumes too, she told us. It was almost as good as Christmas. If the parade becomes an annual event, I'm going to have to rethink my feelings about the ice carnival. The college gates were two stone pillars connected by a black iron arch. Under the arch, the ice carnival the ice carnival people had set up a folding table where volunteers were taking entry forms and money. Mrs. Henry turned to Eve, Sophie, and me. You guys go ahead now and find the other kids you're marching with. I'll find out, I'll fill out your entry form and turn it in. Thanks, Mom, Eve said. We turned to go and Mrs. Henry called us back. Wait. What's your Frisbee team called? She wanted to know. This was a moment when I really missed Yasmin. She would have had a name on the tip of her tongue. But Eve, Sophie, and I looked at each other like, yikes, we had no idea. It was Sophie who stepped up. The Chickadee Court Precision Light Up Frisbee Team. Okay. Eve and I looked at each other. Okay. Then, with Marshmallow following on his leash, we set out to find the neighbors. The first one we came to was Jeremiah, who told us Yasmin couldn't come. This was not a surprise, but I still felt disappointed. Usually, Yasmin would have loved an event like this, one that offered so many opportunities for her to boss people around. How long was she going to be mad at me anyway? After Jeremiah, we found Billy and Michael Jensen, Toby Lee, Ari, Russell and Graham, Kyle, Richmond, and Byron. The Jensens had brought a couple of their friends and Ari had two. Also had two, so all together, there were a lot of kids on our team, plus one grown up, Margie Lee. She had to be there to watch her son, Toby, because he's just little. Also, he's what mom calls a holy terror. <laughs> okay, people, listen up, Sophie shouted. Who besides Eve brought a pet? Kyle raised his hand. He had brought his black cat, Halloween, in a wagon. There was an orange bow tie, a bow, an orange bow tied to Halloween's tail. But the way he was wiggling, you could see that the bow wouldn't be there for long. Nobody else, Sophie yelled. Ari said, it's too cold for my iguana. And Graham said, I have only got a goldfish. And Russell said, he'd left his dog Myrtle home because she got arth she's got arthritis and can't catch a frisbee. Okay, people, fine. So we're gonna focus on the frisbees. Now, here's what we're going to do. I want you to line up in three rows of four. Jeremiah frowned, tugged Sophie's sleeve and said, 
we can't. Sophie looked down at him. Why not? Because there's 14 of us and three lines of four equals 12. Sophie shook her head. Seriously, arithmetic at a time like this? But she turned back to the rest of the kids and said, so line up any way you want. Then what we do is toss the Frisbee. Who's got one? About half of the hands went up. Okay, great. That's enough. And Marshmallow here, where's Marshmallow? Eve held Marshmallow up high so everyone could see. Marshmallow yipped. Yikes, put me down. Marshmallow's own Marshmallow's our Frisbee dog, Sophie explained. You can tell by the bandana, even though he's puny. So what we're going to do is toss the Frisbees to each other. And when we miss, he'll get out there and retrieve. Everybody got that? Everybody did. So now we should practice, right? Eve said. Sophie shook her head. What are we? Wimps? We're gonna just we're just gonna do what comes naturally and blow the pants off of all the other entries. I mean, who's got light up frisbees? Us or them? All right, so we're gonna end there. We're now on chapter 26. Ah, I'm gonna put something out there. Mrs. Henry, Professor Henry's wife, sounded a little suspicious to me. Hopefully she has nothing to do with the missing ice sculptures. But I think she could have something to do with it. Because remember at first, she said that they could check the refrigerated area, storage area, where that the school had built for Professor Henry's hazardous materials. But instead of going there, they went to sign in for the pet costume carnival contest. I thought they were going to go there to check before they went to the carnival, but they didn't. And she said, oh, kids, you go on ahead. I'll sign you in and I will meet you back at the carnival. Mm, it sounded a little suspicious. It would be bad if Mrs. Henry had something to do with the missing ice sculptures. But why? What would be her motive? And remember, Eve's, did, she, did Eve's dad say? Did she say that her dad had an old truck? I believe that Eve's, Eve did say her dad still had an old truck in the garage. So could her mother have had something to do with this? Again, I told you all, there's always more clues and questions than answers, but there are 32 chapters and we on Wonderful Wednesday will be on chapter 28. So, there are not that many chapters left, okay? We got five more chapters. I wonder when it's all gonna come together. Anyway, I'm sorry. I'm thinking because I'm like, I wanna read some more, but I can't. And I'm not going to do it without you all. I promise. So we are at the end of Miss Hope's reading hour. Thank you so much for being here with me on this marvelous President's Day Monday. Please enjoy the rest of your marvelous Monday evening. Have a terrific Tuesday. And I will see you right back here on a wonderful Wednesday on Miss Hope's Reading Hour. Until then, my friends, see you next time.